Good morning. It is my privilege and pleasure to welcome all of you to the inaugural session of our workshop that will keep us busy today and tomorrow in this room. Uh, coffee break will be in a room which is very nearby. As you get out, there are a few steps and you go up and coffee break will be provided there in the morning at 11 and in the afternoon at, uh, I think, 4 5, 4.30. I tell you because so we all know more or less how to limit our intervention to, uh, to this conference, which uh, is very promising, I would say, so that I would uh, also uh, make sure that I give you the personal gratitude of the two colleagues that with me organized this, the workshop, uh, Herminia Camassa, who is sitting over there, Davide Strazzari, and myself, and I'm also uh, bringing you uh, the uh, best regards from our dean, who, because of his uh, institutional duties, cannot be with us uh, this morning. Uh, let me say just very few words of introduction on the, on the topic. Uh, because we are dealing, uh, let me just read again the, 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 the very title of this uh, workshop, Religious Pluralism, Legal Monism, and Personal Law Regimes, Comparing Experiences and Trends. So we are mainly dealing with the, the fact of religious pluralism and legal systems. Uh, of course, uh, I will speak of legal systems not so much in terms of national legal systems, but in terms of uh, legal traditions or legal families, as uh, are studied by systemology, because this is, uh, I think, a proper approach. Of course, we do make reference to individual <coughs> countries as they provide different patterns of regulation, as well as provide different experiences in implementation or non-implementation of the rules that they have given themselves. And also, let me just specify that we try to, this, this is our uh, intent, to deal with religious pluralism as it exists in social life, in real life, not as it is expected to exist just in order to fit into some pre-established categories that the legal system has given itself. Uh, that I would say, I would even dare to say that it is not law, but it is just an attempt at some normative uh, uh, um, uh, theory rather than um, a practice. And of course, we have to remember when we talk about religious pluralism, we have to remember that religion deals with an individual dimension, but also with a communitarian dimension. And here again, uh, uh, at least implicitly, different patterns of regulations are called in, in question. Uh, religious pluralism uh, uh, has, in both dimensions, individual and uh, communitarian, lives through diffuse practices and beliefs, and not always and not necessarily always uh, through established denominations which have their own hierarchies and have their own legal capacity of representation, for instance, to the extent of uh, agreeing on some uh, concordats in the case of the Roman Catholic Church or agreements that are so frequent in uh, Europe at least uh, and have been uh, frequent, frequent in the last decades. Uh, the normative patterns that we have been experiencing so far may prove, and I underline, may prove to be inadequate to deal satisfactorily with the issues that are raised by a wider religious pluralism in society. I think this is something that we have to take into consideration. I'm not here to say that we have to throw away the uh, established patterns, but I think we should try to explore whether new patterns are more fit to uh, govern the uh, present uh, situation. Now, and it is precisely for this perspective, which is a perspective of exploration, of, uh, of research, uh, of questioning, that we have thought, uh, David, uh, Ermine, and I have thought of taking 
Asia and Europe as two scenarios that provide different answers and very rich experiences, in fact. In Europe, we are trying, but I wonder if we, if we are really trying to ensure the compatibility of religious pluralism and legal monism, as we have been practicing for so a long time. Whereas in Asia, religious pluralism is often dealt with within a framework of legal pluralism as evidenced by the practice of personal laws, which is going to be, in the, uh, going to be the object of, um, uh, uh, of uh, discussion uh, during the workshop. So the issues that will keep us occupied today and tomorrow, and as a matter of fact, much longer, uh, are relevant from many points of view. For instance, we may have to face the task of redefining the content of religious freedom as traditionally defined. And also, the issues are relevant uh, for a framework of protection for the negative dimension of freedom of religion, namely freedom from religion. In fact, I'm, I was quite uh, surprised, and in fact, I was quite positively surprised to see that in the provisional program of the forthcoming conference of ECLAS in Oxford next September, the topic uh, is freedom of, for, from, within religion. And uh, <clears throat> the undertitle of the conference is Deferring Dimensions of a Common Right with a question mark. And I think that the title of the conference is absolutely uh, happy. I repeat, freedom of, for, from, within religion. And I mention this because at least five of six uh, of the speakers at the Oxford conference are also speakers at this conference today and tomorrow here in Trento, and I'm particularly glad of this uh, circumstance. Let me also point out that I'm particularly glad that we can organize the conference here at the law faculty in Trento, which is a law faculty that since its very beginning has given a very special role to a comparative law. Let me just mention that the founding father of this law school uh, uh, not only has been, but is Rodolfo Sacco. And of course, I'm very proud to say that since he retired from the University of Turin, he is now professor of legal anthropology here in, in Trento. Um, also, I think it's very important uh, to remember that not only we teach thanks to Rodolfo Sacco Legal Anthropology, but we have also courses such as Introduction to African Law and to Asian Law. And I'm particularly glad that at this very moment, both the first professor that gave the, the first course, Introduction to Asian Law, was Andrew Hardy, who's sitting here, mm -hmm. and the present professor of Introduction to Asian Law is Arif Jamal, who is sitting next to Andrew. So, you are sort of alpha and omega of the, <laughs> of the teaching of uh, Asian law in this law school. Also, let me mention precisely because, uh, because uh, the, this <coughs> conference comes after years of, of research and conversations and, and various seminars, that uh, a few years ago we had started a specialized track of legal education called Law, Religion, and Society that was managed by Erminia Camassa, uh, who is here with us today, and within this track, we offer courses of Italian ecclesiastical law, comparative ecclesiastical law, comparative religious law, canon law, Islamic law, sociology of religions. So I think that it was a very interesting offer <coughs> for uh, our students, and in fact, they uh, showed to, uh, to appreciate this kind of uh, uh, educational proposals. I would also like to welcome the students that are present here today, not as many as I thought, but uh, it is uh, uh, always very interesting that they show interest also apart from uh, attending classes. And also I would like to thank and uh, acknowledge the presence of members of, of the society in Trentino and of religious communities in Trento. It is a pleasure to have them here and take this opportunity for starting some sort of dialogue and also, I would like to uh, make it clear that today we have, and now I'm going to mention a few uh, of the participants, Marco Ventura, who is the uh, 
newly or recently elected director of the Center for Religious Studies at the foundation, Bruno Kessler, here in Trento, um, uh, which is, uh, as you understand from the very title, one of the pillars of uh, research in this area uh, in, in Trento, but of course with a, a, a European scenario, which is very important. Also, I would like to stress uh, to what extent we have a very varied scientific background of the speakers. Law, law and society, law and legal anthropology, law and social anthropology, a must, at least when legal pluralism be concerned, <coughs> law and comparative law, as in the, and uh, systemology. We have, uh, we're going to focus on South Asia, on Southeast Asia, on West Asia, on Europe, and both continent-wise and in particular on two uh, individual countries such as the United Kingdom and Greece which have interesting experiences to offer, uh, uh, the UK in fact being at the heart of many controversies um, that uh, concern also the, the lawmaking process there. Uh, let me express a personal welcome back to Trento to colleagues and friends such as Prakash Shah and Michael Karayanni and of course uh, uh, Lorenzo Duca who has been a scholar in residence here in Trento, uh, to Michele Graziadei, who, uh, although he is very young, but he's a founding father of the law school, just like Rodolfo Sacco. So it's a really pleasure to have you back here. And also I would like to uh, welcome colleagues who are here for the first time, like <coughs> Ilker Zavrosoglu and Roberto Mazzola, who hasn't arrived yet, I think. Uh, the third session will, uh, of tomorrow morning will be more theoretical, and uh, I think that we, uh, we uh, have, again, great expectations from the chair that will uh, be held by Werner Mensky, who will help us to fly up in the sky with his kite, uh, but being high uh, in the sky will help us to see even better what happens on Earth, and, and uh, so uh, that will be also a great contribution. And then finally, let me just say that uh, we're going to have one cake, but we're going to have two red cherries in the sense that the opening speech will be given by Silvio Ferrari, uh, a well-known authority in this field, and the final uh, uh, remarks will be given by another well-recognized authority like Marie-Claire Faublé. And so I, I would like to thank them uh, in particular for having undertaken this particular task uh, and, 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 um, uh, and for having accepted to share your wisdom and your knowledge or your knowledge and your wisdom with all of us uh, today. So I think I said enough um, and uh, all that I have to do, I'm going to chair the session this morning. Uh, as you know, we are, um, we are on, on Shall I say, we are on stream, that's the proper expression. So we are expected to speak in the microphone, both from the table and from the floor. Uh, so we'll, uh, the privilege that we have uh, thought of was to give the benefit of attending the conference, not only personally, but also from uh, all parts of the world. So. <clears throat> The world will be uh, grateful to you as I am uh, to you this morning. So I would say without uh, any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Silvio Ferrari for his inaugural speech. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me here and uh, giving me the honor and also the burden to uh, open uh, uh, this uh, uh, conference. The fact uh, uh, that we meet in the middle of Europe uh, to discuss something that is uh, virtually non-existent in this continent, that is uh, personal law regimes, is uh, the sign of the crisis of an idea that played a leading role in the last two centuries of European history. The idea that equality is the best way to grant freedom. The link between equality and freedom has been firmly established 
In the first article of the Declarations of the Right of Man and of the Citizen, and since then it has been a guiding principle of all constitutional liberal democracies. In the legal regulation of religion, this link is particularly evident. The liberal constitutions of the 19th and 20th centuries were written under the persuasion that religiously based personal laws were against citizens' freedom of religion. Subjecting them to different legal provisions according to the faith they professed made the enjoyment of the civil and political rights dependent on their religious choices. On the contrary, applying the same rules independently from their religion made citizens free to follow the dictates of their conscience without a fear of any negative consequence on their legal status. There are definite cultural, sociological, and political reasons that explain why in Europe the interest for personal law regimes today is on the rise. But there is no time to examine them. Therefore, let me address directly the legal profile of this issue and ask why, contrary to expectations, personal law regimes are considered with increasing attention by many lawyers and legal theorists. One of the answers is that personal law regimes have the ambition to offer a model that is alternative to legal monism, and the alternative consists in a different balance between freedom and equality on the one hand and collective and individual rights on the other. Within the constellation of liberal democracies, countries characterized by legal monism tend to follow the principle that freedom can be better granted through equality, and to attain this goal, place the accent on the equal rights of individuals. Within the same constellation, countries where a religion-based legal pluralism is prevalent tend to follow the principle that freedom can be granted through diversity, and to attain this goal, place the accent on the different rights of communities. I am aware that these are broad generalizations whose soundness needs to be investigated through a careful examination of the legal systems of different states. And this conference is a great opportunity to do that, and at the same time to consider what are the advantages and disadvantages of these two ways to regulate the relationship between freedom and equality on the one hand and individual and community on the other. I shall try to offer food for your, for your thoughts through three questions. However, before addressing them, two clarifications are required. First, I shall take into consideration only personal law regimes that are recognized by the state. In Europe, there are many informal, unofficial, legally unrecognized, but highly effective personal law regimes. I shall not consider them, and this explains why, at the beginning of my presentation, I could affirm that in today's Europe, systems of personal law are non-existent. Second, this last statement does not mean that in Europe, citizens' religious affiliation is irrelevant in the definition of their civil and political rights. On the contrary, these rights can be differently regulated according to the religion that is professed 
by a person. Just to make an example, in many European countries, citizens professing some religions can perform religious marriages that are recognized by the state, while members of other religions are bound to celebrate a civil marriage, a religious marriage being impossible or devoid of civil effects. Therefore, the statement that no personal law regime are in force in Europe must be understood in the sense that there is no substantial and coherent set of rules encompassing a whole area of legal relations, family, inheritance, etc., that applies to citizens according to their religious affiliation. In other words, in Europe there are personal legal provisions and even personal laws, but not personal law regimes. From this point of view, there is nothing comparable to the personal law systems that are in force in India, Israel, or Malaysia. Why is it so? It is the first question I would like to raise. When we think of personal law regimes, India, Malaysia, or Israel come to our mind, certainly not Italy, France, or Germany. Why is it so? There are many answers to this question, and to make matters easier, I shall discard all explanations based on the political, economic, and social history of these countries, and I shall focus on uh, religion. Therefore, my first question is whether there is something in the religious history, demography, and culture of Asia and Europe that helps us to understand why personal law regimes are adopted more frequently in the former than in the latter continent. To find an answer, it is possible to explore different avenues. Most European countries have a Christian cultural background, while the Asian countries I just mentioned have a Hindu, Muslim, or Jewish prevailing tradition. Shall we seek an answer, then, in the different religious background of Europe and Asia? However, this line of research seems to be disproved by the fact that in the few Asian countries with a predominantly Christian history, Lebanon or Philippines, for example, personal law regimes are in force. Without excluding that one religion can be more conducive than another to these legal regimes, this answer seems to be unable to fully explain the difference. Trying to link personal law regimes to polytheistic religions and their rejection of a single god is another dead-end avenue, as shown by the fact that systems of personal law are adopted in countries where a rigidly monotheistic faith, like Islam or Judaism, is predominant. The same can be said for explanations grounded on religious demography. Personal law regimes are in force both in countries characterized by a strong religious diversity, Lebanon and Singapore, for example, and in countries religiously homogeneous, Jordan. Confronted with these difficulties, we could conclude that religion is not a significant factor in the establishment of a personal law regime and close our search by pointing to primarily non-religious events and processes, the colonial experience, the patriarchal structure of society, etc., 
is that the main reasons for the existence of a personal law systems. However, this is not my answer. In my opinion, there is a religion-connected explanation of why personal law regimes are more widespread in some parts of Asia than in Europe, and some historical considerations can help us to understand it. For a long time in Europe, personal law regimes have been the rule rather than the exception. They started being questioned only after the formation of the first European national states, France, Spain, England, in the 15th and 16th centuries. These new political bodies claimed their absolute sovereignty both at the supra- and infranational level. In the, the first case, it was a matter of affirming the national state independence from the power of the supranational entities embodied by the emperor and the pope. And this goal was attained through the development of a strong notion of national sovereignty based on the principle rex superiorem non recognitions in regno suo. The king does not recognize any superior in his realm. At infranational level, the national states engaged in a long struggle against all the local powers that had flourished during the Middle Ages. The autonomy of city-states, guilds, universities, religious orders, was progressively limited, and the sovereign strengthened his authority, reserving to himself the monopoly of the legislative, judicial, and military power. A centralized system of government took shape, creating new institutions at national level and attracting in the state sphere of influence areas of human life, family, education, welfare, etc., that previously were largely left to private regulation. It is a long and complex process which took centuries to be completed. However, in the 19th century, the state victoriously concluded its long battle against supra- and infranational competitors and could take the last step towards complete independence, severing its bonds with religion. Until the first half of that century, apart from the parenthesis of the French Revolution and Napoleon's empire, the European states had remained confessional states, recognizing their subordination to religion and their obligation to provide a privileged legal status to the faithful of the true religion. This dependence had prevented them the development of a fully monistic legal system. Now, the state affirms its secular nature and can provide its citizens with a uniform regulation of their civil and political rights, irrespective of their religion. In this way, the secularization of the public sphere joins the centralization of the legal system and the personal law regimes based on religion become doubly incompatible with modern national states because they contradict both secularization and centralization. At this point, a long series of distinctions, specifications, warnings would be required, as the process I described is very general, has been carried out differently in different places and times, 
and has never been fully implemented. Just to make an example, systems of personal law were in force in the Russian and Austro-Hungarian Empire until the First World War. And even now, systems of concordats and agreements between states and religious communities grant the latter's followers special rights. I shall skip all these caveats because I want only to point at the general direction taken by Europe where the consolidation of national states has been accompanied by the secularization of the public institutions and the decline of personal law regimes. Investigating whether a similar process is recognizable in Malaysia, Israel, India, and other Asian countries can help to answer the first question I raised. The second question I'd like to bring to your attention is the following. Are personal law regimes an effective tool to govern cultural and religious diversity? The wisest answer to this question is it depends. It depends on the legal tradition of the country we are speaking of. What is effective in a given place and time can be useless in a different context. It depends also on what we mean by governing cultural and religious diversity. Even within the horizon of liberal constitutionalism, diversity can be seen as a threat to social cohesion or as a precondition for a vibrant civil society. And depending on these different perceptions, governing diversity can result in restricting or expanding it. Therefore, let me reframe the question in a way that is more consonant with the goal of liberal democracies. Are personal law regimes and particularly those regimes that are based on religion, an effective tool to grant people the possibility to live according to their religious beliefs and practices? Here again, the answer is it depends, but this time it depends on the way the personal law regime is conceived and regulated. Religious beliefs and practices are not a static reality. They can change. A Christian can become a Muslim and vice versa. A religiously based personal law regime where changing or abandoning religion entails negative consequences on the civil and political rights of an individual does not help people to live according to their religious convictions. This is the bottom line that should never be trespassed and makes the difference between a legal pluralism of choice and a legal pluralism of constraint. I am not thinking only of those countries where conversion from one religion to another is forbidden and people are chained to the personal law regime corresponding to, to the religion in which they were born. I am thinking also of the countries like Israel, where abandoning a religion without taking up another places an individual in a no man land where, for example, it is impossible to perform a state-recognized civil marriage. Granting effective opting out rights from the religious group, putting in place mechanisms that offer a secular alternative to religiously inspired legal practices, and encouraging reforms that reduce the level of disparity that affects the weakest group members are three necessary steps to bring under control 
the components of segregation and discrimination that can easily vitiate personal law regimes. In my view, these requirements constitute a bottom line of general application in the sense that no religion-based personal law is acceptable if these conditions are not met. Once this threshold has been crossed, whether a personal law regime increases or decreases the chances to live according one's religious beliefs and practices is largely a matter of legal engineering. Personal law regimes can be assembled in many different ways. They may be limited to personal status and family law matters, as in Israel, or extended to some parts of criminal law, as in Malaysia, as far as Muslims are concerned. They may leave citizens the possibility to choose between different systems, as in South Africa, or compel them to stick to the one established by their religion, as in Israel, or include both options, as in Malaysia, where non-Muslims can perform a civil or a religious marriage, while Muslims cannot take advantage of the first possibility. They may be implemented the personal law in its integrity, as in India, where Muslims are allowed to perform polygamous marriages, or can exclude some of its parts, as in Israel, where Muslims do not have this right. They may be supported by a system of religious adjudication, it is the case of Israel, but not of South Africa, which may be exclusive or concurrent with other systems, and so on. These differences are far from being irrelevant, and this conference is the right place to evaluate and compare them. However, the significance and impact on citizens' life of each personal law regime cannot be considered abstracting from the context. It would be naive looking for an answer to the question, what is the personal legal regime that grants citizens the best chance to live according to their religious or non-religious convictions? There is no answer because the question is wrong. It assumes, it assumes that legal systems can be compared by abstracting them from their social, cultural, historical, and political background. The personal law systems of India and South Africa are different, but there is no point in asking whether one is better than the other in abstracto. The correct question is, which is the system that is best suited to the conditions of the country where it is implemented? Let me address now my third and final question. The position paper of this conference contrasts the legal monism prevailing in Europe to the legal pluralism of many Asian countries, where religion-based personal law regimes reflect the religious diversity of their societies. Considering that Europe is rapidly becoming a religiously plural society, the, questions, the question I'd like to raise is, are personal law regimes a viable alternative to European legal monism? All over the world, politicians, opinion leaders, and academics discuss the advantages and disadvantages of personal law regimes. I shall not enter into this debate, which is well known, and shall limit myself to point at the fact that the European modern tradition is against them. Keeping this in mind, one can wonder whether personal law regimes 
are a sound and effective way to deal with the increasing religious diversity of Europe, or whether other options are available and preferable. There is no agreement about these alternative options. However, many legal experts and scholars suggest that before resorting to personal law regimes, it is worth exploring the possibilities to strengthen the pluralistic potentialities that already exist in the legal systems of the European countries. This strategy is grounded on the assumption that the European legal systems can make strides in terms of internal pluralism and in this way can meet the needs of immigrant communities as well as of indigenous people. This claim needs to be carefully examined and family law is a good testing ground. In the last 30 years, family law underwent an impressive process of transformation in many Western countries. In some of them, this change resulted in the pluralization of the legal patterns of family formation, giving citizens the possibility to choose among opposite and same-sex marriages, civil partnerships, domestic unions, and other forms of family relationship. In different ways, the same process of pluralization affected the dissolution of marriage and adoption. Gender, rather than religion, has been at the heart of these transformations, and answering gender diversity has been the goal that states pursued through the reform of family law. Many wonder whether the same process can be replicated to address the issue of religious diversity. Instead of reintroducing personal law regimes in the European legal systems, they propose that the internal pluralism of state family laws is further enlarged to give people of different religions the same variety of family patterns that has been granted to people of different sexual orientations. What would be the practical implement implication of this choice is widely discussed. Some advocate the extension of the area of individual autonomy allowing spouses to enter into prenuptial arrangements that can accommodate their religious requirements. Other play, others place the accent on mechanism of mediation and arbitration that grant citizens the right to choose between the jurisdiction of the state courts and alternative dispute resolution procedures and institutions. A few scholars go one step further and are in favor of enlarging the range of marriage model, models offered by state law. For example, ensuring the possibility to conclude covenant marriages as already happens in some parts of the United States. Each of these proposals raise a number of serious questions that concern public order, equal treatment, and the rule of law. However, the weight of these reservations should not detract from the interest of these proposals that are not conceived for the members of a religious group, but for all the citizens. They try to answer the needs of the whole society instead of those of particular groups, starting from the principle that the increasing religious diversification of Europe is not a threat to be contained through special group rights, but an opportunity 
to build a more inclusive European public space. For this reason, it is worth considering whether this option can be a valid alternative to the personal law regimes. Well, I see that I have uh, already exceeded my uh, time uh, limits, so I shall uh, stop uh, here, hoping that uh, the, three, the three questions I raised can give a contribution to our discussion of today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ferrandi. They, will, they certainly will uh, help us. And uh, I am I'm, I'm quite uh, positive that the way you put together such a huge scenario, both historical and geographical, uh, will be of, of great help uh, for all of us. Now, let us uh, start after the inaugural uh, address. Let us start the first session. Uh, we are going to have three speakers. I'm sorry to, to announce that our colleague, uh, Buin Gok Tson, from uh, National University of Singapore, cannot be with us today. So we are going to uh, miss the perspective of Confucian constitutionalism. Although I trust that a book is about to come out, or has come out it's already. Oh, it has already come out. Mm -hmm. And so if whoever is interested in Confucian constitutionalism uh, will be able to, 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 to know more about it. So we have three papers now. And uh, you were perfectly on time, Professor Ferrari. So there's no, no doubt about it. And we are going to deal with uh, three of the countries which have been uh, more than once uh, mentioned in the uh, inaugural speech, uh, which means uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and India. The first paper will be given by Andrew Hardin from the National University of Singapore, and it will be on constitutional protection of and from religion-based personal laws in Malaysia. Understand we have... I didn't know you used slides. Do you always use slides? Um, well, I didn't. Until a short time ago. Okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah. it would be very can I, nice. Can I sit over there? Absolutely. And the Just make sure you have a mic. Uh, you, you take this microphone with you. Could you uh, jump? Uh, thank you, Andrew. I'd prefer to stand if, that, if that's all right. I can see everybody a bit better uh, from here. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, uh, Roberto, for the in invitation and for the introduction. It's always a huge pleasure to be back in Trento and to, on this occasion, reacquaint myself with some old friends, as, as well as uh, meeting some very interesting new ones. Um, <clears throat> okay, so my, my brief is to uh, talk about Malaysia, which uh, Silvio has already already mentioned, um, uh, and uh, I mean, fo following on from his kind of interesting distinctions between Europe and other parts of the world, um, I, I I like to quote here um, Clermont Ferrand, who, at the height of the French Revolution, said that nothing shall be given to the Jews as a nation, but everything shall be given to them as individuals. Uh, so that seems to me a summation of the kind of the European tradition when it comes to uh, looking at issues of community and religion. But the interesting point here is from uh, a Southeast Asian perspective, um, this proposition is totally and utterly untrue to the, to the extent that I don't think it would even be comprehended in most Southeast Asian countries where religion is seen as something very much inherent to communities rather than individuals, even though constitutions tend to enshrine an individual uh, right to freedom of religion. This is seen through, uh, <clears throat> through the lens of communities rather than, uh, rather than ind individuals. So I think that might be a, a starting point um, <clears throat> in terms of how we might look at legal pluralism 
and systems of personal law in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, let me just add here that out of the 10 countries in ASEAN, as many as seven of them recognize um, a system of personal law for Muslims that is officially enshrined in the law and the constitution. Of those 10 countries, only Cambodia, uh, Laos, and Vietnam do not have uh, such a system of separate personal law for, for Muslims. So we're talking about something very uh, general <coughs> in Southeast Asia. So uh, this is the, um, the cover designed for my uh, book, The Constitution of Malaysia, a Contextual Analysis. And the idea of this design is really to, sorry, that's not very well presented on the slide, uh, but uh, the idea of it is to present the kind of pluralism that you have in this particular country, where as many as 179 different uh, ethnic groups are recognized, and that's also obviously reflected in religion as well. <coughs> so this is the... Uh, uh, the Palace of Justice in uh, the, the administrative off capital the light of there, Putrajaya. <clears throat> Thank you. We're switching off the light. Oh, good. Okay. Sorry. So that, yeah, that it comes up much better, doesn't it? No, the, the wrong one. Yeah, what, what, you, what you did the first time was the best. Good. Is it? No? <clears throat> Uh, okay. Now, uh, as you'll see, although this uh, building houses the so-called civil courts, um, the courts that use the common law uh, system in Malaysia, the building has a very distinctly uh, Islamic appearance uh, about it. I, I always think judicial architecture tells you a great deal about the about the legal system. And and uh, by contrast, this is one of the uh, <coughs> one of the Sharia courts which administers uh, Islamic personal law for. For Muslims. Um, now, uh, at NUS, we always kind of have this joke that every seminar ends with the proposition that it was all the fault of the British. Um, to the contrary, I think seminars should begin with that proposition rather than end with them. But uh, here is a very good example. And uh, uh, so this bifurcated, as I call it, legal system uh, in Malaysia is indeed, in a sense, all, all the fault of the British. So before the British came along, um, you had sort of roughly speaking a system of Islamic law modified by Adat or Malay custom being administered by the traditional rulers uh, through the exercise of their own prerogative uh, powers. And then came the, the Pankor Treaty of 1874, which was a, a precursor to all of the treaties enshrining the British residential system in Malaya, um, which required the local rulers to accept British advice in all matters except Islam and Malay custom. So right there at the beginning of this process, you get this bifurcation uh, in, in all of these uh, states, which has led to this bifurcated legal system, which is now the source of considerable uh, constitutional uh, tensions in Malaysia, which have been mounting over the last 15 years or so. So let me let me explain it. The, the uh, Independence Constitution of 1957 um, contains Article 3, which says that uh, Islam is the religion of the Federation, but other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony. It was very controversial to introduce that uh, provision. Some people were completely against it. Other people wanted a much more stronger statement. But the, the clear intention was to establish Islam in roughly the same position as Anglicanism is established in England. It wasn't intended really as anything more than that, but this provision is now being used as evidence that some kind of an Islamic state was intended by the constitution makers. This is completely false, actually, if you look at the historical documentation. But, but this is how provisions of that kind can give rise to great difficulty 40 or 50 or 60 years down, down the track. Now, very oddly, although Islam is the religion of the federation, Islam itself is a state matter under the, under the federal constitution. It's not a federal matter. Uh, as, as such. So Article 11 provides for freedom of religion much in the same way as you will hear about India and other 
and other countries. But there are some exceptions, one of which um, is an exception for the propagation of religions other than Islam uh, amongst Muslims. So Islam enjoys special protection against proselytization uh, within this constitutional system, reflecting the special status of Islam under, under Article 3. Now, um, for the purposes of what I want to talk about, what is really important is an, an, an amendment in 1988 to Article 121, which uh, provide, provides or provided for the separation of the judicial power, a concept which is now sort of disappeared from Article 121. There's no express statement about judicial power. But what it does say, which is relevant for our purposes, is that the civil court shall have no jurisdiction in respect of any matter within the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. This is because the civil courts had tended to se second guess the Sharia courts on issues of Islamic law where they were not strictly qualified because they weren't the judges are not necessarily trained in Islamic law, whereas the judges in the Sharia court are. So um, the, that was the idea of this provision, but it had the effect of driving an even deeper wedge into the legal system, uh, which has created great complications at the present time. So... Um, there is this idea that is constantly debated that uh, Malaysia either is already or conceivably should become an Islamic state. And here I just want to set out some of the reference points where this debate becomes quite intense. Um, one is very obviously Article 3 itself. What exactly does it mean if you enshrine uh, Islam as the religion of the Federation, what are the implications of that? And what are the implications of other religions being able to be practiced in peace and harmony? Incidentally, on that second issue, um, the courts have recently held, and you may find this quite bizarre, that where it says other religions shall be practiced in, uh, may be practiced in peace and harmony, that means that other religions are allowed so long as they do not disturb the majority in the practice of their religion, uh, which I'm very sure is not what was originally intended uh, by that provision, which is supposed to reassure the minorities, not provide a basis for protection of the majority religion. But that's, you know, that, that is what the Court of Appeal has said on, on that particular uh, provision. So is uh, Islam, so that's the constitutional status of Islam. Is Islam a, a source of, of law? Uh, yes, but mainly only as personal law for Muslims, but there are some other areas you can find Islamic law in relation to finance, for example. Arif knows much more about this than I do, but uh, that's an, an obvious other area. <coughs> and and uh, there are proposals to introduce uh, hudud as uh, criminal laws in Malaysia, which have met very considerable constitutional obstacles at this point. Some laws have been passed, but they cannot be at the state level, but they can't be implemented for constitutional reasons. Now, what about the status of the Sharia courts? Constantly a, a source of discussion. Are they now, after the 1988 amendment, are they to be regarded as on an equal status with the civil courts, or do they still have some kind of subordinate status as they do in Singapore, as uh, Arif will tell us uh, shortly. Um, now, um, as I see it, and uh, I think it would be fair to say the courts have recently endorsed this position, um, the Sharia courts are still, in a sense, subsidiary, albeit separated from the civil courts, in the sense that the civil court uh, has the final say over what the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts is. And it's these jurisdictional questions that have created the greatest difficulty. So recently, in this case called SDPA, the federal court actually just two months ago held uh, that uh, civil court orders override Sharia court orders. Quite literally, you had situations where the the Inspector General of Police was faced with two court orders, both of which were supposed to be 
um, enforced by him, but they contradicted each other. So he would hold up the two orders and say, please tell me, which of these orders am I supposed to follow? And the answer is you follow the order of the civil court, not the order of the, of the Sharia court. Uh, so there have been these other efforts. I don't think we need to go into this in any detail. In terms of Islamization of the law at the uh, state level, so various initiatives to expand the scope of uh, Islamic law by various statutes and government, local government bylaws and things of that kind, uh, in an effort to sort of break out of what a lot of Muslims see as the kind of the stranglehold of colonial law. This is the kind of um, major grievance arising from the colonial period, the fault of the British, as you might say, uh, that Islamic law was kind of displaced onto one side by the, the sort of influx of, of common law institutions and, and principles. And some people want to correct that balance either by introducing a sort of equality between the two systems or, um, or simply replacing the common law with Islamic law or by finding ways of, of melding the two together. And I think that's a very interesting proposition that some people have been working on in, in, that, uh, in that country. So uh, coming back to freedom of religion itself, um, there are many restrictions on freedom of religion um, one of which I've already mentioned, the first one, um, restrictions on Islamic teaching. It's often um, presented that freedom of religion represents freedom for Muslims but not for non-Muslims in Malaysia. This is not actually true. Um, Muslims are subjected to, to much more restriction, many more restrictions than non-Muslims in terms of the practice of religion. Uh, for example, very obviously, with the position on apostasy, but also in terms of the, the teaching of, of, Muslim, of, of Islamic doctrine uh, in Malaysia. You can, you can teach almost anything under Christianity, but you can teach almost nothing other than conventional views under, uh, under Islam. Uh, so there are lots of restrictions on distribution of un-Islamic material. I'll mention a case on that. Uh, shortly, and, and issues such as whether the Bible can be published in, in Malay, uh, or even whether the Quran can be published in, in Malay, those, these are sort of issues. Um, and then concern about in, the enhanced jurisdiction of the Sharia courts, with more than 50 notable cases on Article 121 and the issue of jurisdiction between these, these two systems. Let me just be clear here that this is often presented as a a conflict between two court systems. That's not strictly right, because the, what happens is that the civil court system tends on the whole to defer to the Sharia system. Um, and while there is a conflict, it's not strictly a conflict between two sets of courts, each trying to expand or protect its own jurisdiction. Uh, the conflict is rather between the wider communities that are kind of using the legal system in order to further their particular um, uh, agenda. That's, that is the, the grating, the rub of this that is really, I think, uh, important. Uh, so there have been lots of problems with conversion and apostasy. I'm sure we'll hear much more uh, about that. Um, issues have focused on burials, you know, what sort of... Uh, what, what sort of burial system or cremation system should be applied. Sometimes you get people who have secretly uh, converted or alleged to have, be, have converted from one religion to another, and then who, who is responsible for the burial or, or cremation. That gives rise to great difficulty. And most of all, the custody of children. This is, I think, the biggest issue. The custody of children when uh, a parent converts. Usually what happens is that a father father converts to Islam, usually from Hinduism, and then there's a tussle over the religion and therefore also the custody of the children. And there have been some tragic cases of women having their children suddenly taken away from them, only to be uh, told by the civil court that there is no remedy except in the Sharia court, but they have no remedy in the Sharia court because they're not Muslims. So they sort of fall into this big black hole right in the middle of the legal 
legal system. And I had the interest and pleasure of meeting one of these victims of Article 121 uh, uh, the other day uh, in Malaysia, a woman called Indira Gandhi, no relation to the Prime Minister of India, um, who, um, you know, has struggled for something like 10 years to, you know, to get her kids back with no, um, you know, occasionally the prospect of a remedy only suddenly to be taken away. It's a very, you know, very tragic case, actually. Um, and then, um, you know, there has been a kickback, particularly uh, th there have been attempts to organize uh, cross-faith um, initiatives to resist uh, this issue of expanding jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. And in particular, um, the, uh, uh, you've got this Hindu rights movement called Hindraf, which has protested quite a lot about re religious discrimination against uh, Hindus. Uh, in Malaysia. Another, another problem is the licensing of places of worship or even the design of places of worship, which has been a big issue in a number of Southeast Asian countries, as I believe it is in Switzerland and other parts of, of Europe as well. Uh, so just to mention here some of the, the cases, I guess the famous one really is, is a 2007 case of Lena Joy, which I'll, I will come on to. I think many of you will have heard of this. Um, the custody case that uh, I've already mentioned. Um, there was a big case involving Borders Bookshop where uh, they were selling a book written um, from a very radical feminist uh, dissenting Muslim perspective uh, by this uh, Canadian Muslim woman. Uh, and uh, the religious department came along and uh, seized the book and arrested uh, Borders Bookshop manager, who happened to be a Muslim woman purely by chance. And then she claimed that she was being discriminated against because she was a Muslim. Because if she had been a Christian, they would have had no power to arrest her. Uh, and so that case went on for a very long time. And eventually, the, the Sharia prosecutors dropped the case against her for distributing un-Islamic material. I mean, she said she had no idea what was in all, all these books. Her only duty was to stack them and sell them. Uh, so this is the kind of issue that is coming up. And then more, more recently, uh, the Allah case, uh, which I'll, I will say a little bit about. But let's come back to Lena Joy first. Lena Joy was brought up as a, uh, as a Muslim with a Muslim name converted to Christianity and changed her name in order to marry uh, a Christian. In Malaysia, you have to get your identity card changed if you want to do this, if you are a Muslim with the letter M on your uh, identity card. So um, because of different systems of, of marriage registration, as Sylvia, I think, mentioned uh, earlier on. Um, and so she went to the registration department to change her identity card, and they said, no, we can't do that unless you get an order from the Sharia court saying that you have apostatized. Now, there were very good reasons why Lena Joy did not go to the Sharia courts, because basically she would have been detained possibly for up to two years uh, for correction of her attitude under Akida laws that apply in most of the states in Malaysia. So very good reasons not to go there. And she very plausibly, said, why do I need to court to tell me what my religion is? The Constitution says I have freedom of religion, uh, and, and therefore, uh, you know, why should it be subject to any court or any administrative agency to decide what my religion is? Well, unhappily, she, she lost the case eventually, um, and the, the highest court ruling by two to one in the face of a very, very strong and convincing dissenting judgment by, unhappily, the only non-Muslim judge on the court, um, they, they decided that the registration department acted within their powers. And, and this was a very big uh, issue of protest across the country on both sides of the case. And here are some uh, pictures showing you those, those protests. And I like the, 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 uh, the Hindu man in the middle holding up his identity card as much as to say to the camera, I too am a Malaysian citizen and you have to treat me equally. <clears throat> so um, this is the, the now famous Allah case. Now what happened here was that the, the government um, uh, uh, banned the use of the word Allah 
in a publication called the Catholic Herald in its Malay version. There are Malay-speaking Catholics in Malaysia. Not many, but enough to have a separate issue of this particular magazine. Actually, a lot of those people live in East Malaysia, and I'll come back to that in, in a moment. Uh, now, um, this ban was, um, was challenged in the courts, and the, the judge um, on judicial review uh, quashed uh, the government's ban, saying that it was irrational in the administrative law sense of the term. And uh, uh, the government then uh, uh, appealed and uh, successfully, and the the case that was actually being brought by the Catholic Archbishop of Kuala Lumpur uh, was then appealed further, or attempted to be appealed further to the federal court. But very bizarrely, the the court instead of um, agreeing to grant leave and then hearing the appeal, rejected the application for leave. Uh, with a bench of seven judges who decided four to three uh, to uh, reject the application for leave, delivering a judgment of more than 100 pages and addressing not the issue of leave, but the, sub the substance of the case itself, which is a complete abuse of the leave application process. Uh, but, you know, it was almost as though the court could not be seen to allow that the Archbishop had an, even an arguable case in the highest court, despite the, you know, the, the split decision of the judges uh, uh, you know, at, at these three levels of, of court. So this is a very disappointing uh, uh, case. Now, the, the whole point of this was that um, some Muslims, and the government sort of agreed with this, claimed that this use of Allah by Catholics, Malay-speaking Catholics, to describe their own God was um, you know, improper use of language and was insulting to Islam and also could create disorder. Well, it did create disorder, but only because the government banned it, because it's been going on for 500 years without any problem whatsoever. And I understand the same is true in the Middle East as it is in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, so, so there we are. Now, oddly, this ban does not apply in East Malaysia, which has many indigenous Malay-speaking Catholic. So how something can be insulting and dangerous in West Malaysia but is perfectly okay in East Malaysia is a little bit beyond me, but uh, this is the official government uh, position on this, uh, on this ban of the use of the word uh, Allah. Uh, so, okay. Um, I think you get the idea of these conflicts over jurisdiction. I think the important thing now is to ask some questions, and this is really the difficult part of my presentation, I think. Um, why this extended conflict the last 15 years or so after more than 100 years of peaceful coexistence of two or maybe even at least two legal systems in this part of the world? Um, going back to 1957, there appeared to be a very clear agreement about this between the different communities. Uh, instead of arguing what the position should be looking forward, both sides of this debate have gone back to 1957 and asked the question, what is the correct interpretation of what happened? So it's really an attempt by some people to kind of wrench the Constitution away from its foundations into a totally different tenor of interpretation. Right? And um, this is being done, I think, for very obviously nakedly political reasons. And the foundation of the argument is really on, th there are two bases for it. One. Uh, is that Muslims will be confused if they are presented with alternatives. The second is that Islam will be threatened in terms of its integrity, its position, and its membership uh, by, well, almost anything that could be conceived to threaten it. Um, now, the first proposition about being confused actually occurs many times in the judgments in the case law. This cannot be allowed because Muslims will be confused. Why Muslims are particularly open to being confused is, is a bit beyond me. 
one cartoonist satirized this position rather effectively by showing a small boy running to his father and saying, Papa, I am very confused because the boy next door calls his father Papa. <laughs> right, I think that tells you what you need to know about this, this, uh, this position. Uh, so, in essence, there is no need for this conflict because the issue was already settled. Uh, effectively in 1957, and is based on, um, you know, not, uh, not just a hundred years of coexistence of the common law and Islamic law, but many hundreds of years of coexistence of Islamic law with other conceptions of law in that part of the world. So it goes way, you know, b before the common law was even heard of uh, in, uh, in, in this area. So what is the best way to resolve this kind of conflict? This is something that has really occupied my mind recently because one of the questions might be, why is all this dealt with through litigation and court decisions? Are there not better ways or different ways of, of doing this? And I've made a point of asking lawyers and even litigants in person, I've asked them, you know, why litigate, especially when you know, you look at the, your, your lawyer will tell you, look at the cases, your chances of winning are actually very small. So why do you, you lawyers and, 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 and parties continue to litigate this question? The answer is, I suppose, fairly predictable. Um, they say, well, um, you know, my client had no choice. There's nowhere else to go ultimately than the courts. Yes, you may well lose, but what else to do? There's no other mechanism. There is no ADR for this kind of thing. You can only rest on your constitutional rights. And uh, it is not, they say, that lawyers have a kind of an agenda in a political sense to defend or promote certain positions. Well, actually, I think they do, but they don't admit to it. Um, but, but rather that that is the nature of the situation when individual rights are in question. I mean, you, there's nowhere else you can go. There are no tribunals. There's no mechanism. So that's one answer. But, um, but my feeling is that um, you, there are good reasons why you should keep with litigation in certain ways, but there are also good reasons to have other mechanisms. What I mean by this is that litigation actually has the effect of bureaucratizing the, the major issues that society has to confront. So that very um, awkward issues tend to get sort of chewed up by paperwork and interlocutory injunctions and theological debates and all sorts of issues of that kind, which actually lowers the tension. <coughs> And I think that's why, in a sense, government is quite happy uh, to, for the courts to deal with these issue, issues because largely they can trust the courts to do what the government wants. Not always, but largely they can. Uh, while also saying, well, it's not our decision. That's the court's decision. We didn't uh, perpetrate this atrocity or this whatever it is. Uh, it's not our responsibility to do that. It's the court's responsibility. So they can politically distance themselves from the very problematical issues. There are no votes in this. You can lose a lot of votes, but you can't win them very many votes out of these religious issues. That's the, the political reality, I think. Um, but at the same time, if we are talking about, m more generally, the relations between different communities, which is really what is at issue in the Lena Joy case, I mean, not from her perspective, obviously, but from society's perspective, that is really what is in involved here, then maybe other mechanisms are needed. And um, so far, there has been no um, really uh, convincing or successful mechanism created uh, other than the initiative of local religious leaders, um, which is pleasing when you find that happening, to meet with other religious leaders and try to find common ground on issues like places of worship and, uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, the way in which religious communities behave and that sort of thing, which has a long tradition of success in Southeast Asia going back 
many hundreds of years with many religions being practiced together in a small space. Very combination experience, as, as we will hear, I'm sure. Um, so I think that is what is necessary. Another um, mechanism which I really don't like has been suggested, which is the idea of having a constitutional court to resolve the uh, jurisdictional uh, conflicts. And I have many reasons, I won't go into this, for rejecting this as a plausible uh, solution to the issue of, of, uh, of, of jurisdiction. So, so um, let, me, let me finish this off. What, what are, uh, this is the really difficult question. What are the lessons to be drawn from this study? I think that they are both positive and negative. Um, from a Malaysian perspective, this is a very, very dangerous and very intense issue. And it's the major issue facing society in that part of the world. Um, but it has been con uh, conducted, I wouldn't say in a civil way, but I will say in a very clearly non-violent way. The only violence that has been perpetrated throughout all of these things has been a little bit of violence against property, but not against persons. And unhappily, that's not something we can say of every part of the world as you know. So I think that is very, is very positive. To some extent, um, the courts have been successful in sort of finessing these issues into small bureaucratic channels. And that has been successful, even if it doesn't really solve the underlying issues. Can you ever solve these underlying issues might be another, another question. So I think there are, there are some positive and some uh, negative conclusions. But I just want to finally mention another jurisdiction, which is within Malaysia, and that's Sarawak. Because if you wanted to look at a society that has something close to perfect legal pluralism, then I would ask you to look at Sarawak, because I don't know of any similar case across the world. Um, they have their separate, their own legal system in Sarawak. They have a separate system of Sharia courts. They have a separate system of native courts that administer adat or, or Malay custom or native custom to many different groups of, uh, of, of communities in that area. They all have their own different form of adat. The official, the civil legal system recognizes Chinese customary law as personal law and recognizes Hindu law as personal law as well. So in terms of the makeup of that community, there is no group of people that does not have its personal law enforced by the ordinary courts or by special courts uh, in relation to that community. And that system works perfectly well. None of the conflicts that I've mentioned in this presentation is actually evident in Sarawak. They basically don't care what happens in the rest of the country. Their only problem is if people manipulate them from outside, which unfortunately is happening. So if you look at this example, legal pluralism can be made to work, but you need to have the right structures. You need a lot of toleration. And in that part of the world, there's quite a lot of intermingling in terms of mixed marriages and that sort of thing. And just finally, an image for you. Last time I was in Sarawak, I was sitting around a table at dinner with four lawyers, and one of them was a, was a, uh, was a, a, a Chinese Buddhist, another was an Indian Hindu, a third was a Malay Muslim, and a fourth uh, was an indigenous Catholic. And I said, you know, isn't this a, an amazing kind of thing that, you know, you can... You've got four different groups represented, at least four groups in, in, you know, in, in a group of, uh, of four people. And we're all sitting down discussing the same issues. And it's not everywhere that you would find that happening. And they were quite mystified. This is totally and utterly normal uh, you know, in, in Sarawak. And, uh, and the explanation, they said, is we are all brothers-in-law. You know, and, and I thought that was a sort of wonderful way of, of putting it. So I just want to finish on that positive note, but thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Andrew, also for these final remarks, which uh, give us a little bit of uh, Asian atmosphere, relaxed Asian atmosphere, of course. There will be other examples, but I don't want to, to go any farther. Now, we, are, we have five minutes before coffee break, so I don't want to give the floor uh, now to, uh, to Francesco, because he wouldn't have time. Uh, to uh, give us his paper. So I wonder if there are some very uh, short questions that may uh, uh, require short answers, I would say, from both speakers, if you, if you agree. So is anything that we may raise and... Uh, yes, please. Uh, could you... Could you... Uh, is anybody here to give him the, the microphone? Mike. My, my question is to Professor Ferrari. I, I enjoyed very much the presentation, but there's an illusion of monism in, in Europe, I guess, in the sense that if you take into consideration private international law rules, you do consider the personal law of people that would come to Europe. Uh, two people that were married in Morocco under Sharia, and they end up in Italy, and you would need to determine whether the marriage is valid or not you would refer to their personal law as the law of their nationality, uh, which can be their religious law. So actually, even in the West, you are considering religious law, and, and it's not perfectly this image of, of, of just one civil uh, legal system. And, and the second remark, you do have a collective identity in Europe, even in states where it is still very much, according to the dominant majority group's interest. So when the Christian majority evolved in Europe as it evolved, it determined the public sphere in what suits it best. It's, it's a reflection of, of that majority's uh, religious attitudes and, and, and yeah, you won't have an exam here in Trento on Christmas, but you might have an exam on Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Adha or Yom Kippur. That's not by chance, right? It, it, it is because of a circumstance. So what, what exists is, is actually a reflection of the majority interest, and that majority interest happens to be very much dominated by what the majority perceives as its secular or religious uh, identity. And my third question, we can, we can have it open. Why, why do you think the family is so much connected to citizenship? I mean, religion is a private matter. Uh, I've discussed it elsewhere. I have my own thesis. But there's a very intrinsic relationship between what defines the family, who can marry whom, and how the state perceives citizenship. Uh, because that goes to your first question, as citizenship developed, the nation state developed in one sense, then it would preclude personal law uh, from dominating uh, family law matters. What is the intrinsic relationship? Why, why is it so a close of a relationship between what defines the family and how we conceive of citizenship? Thank you. Now, I think only Professor Ferrari can give a short answer to, <laughs> to such questions. I uh, promised short questions, but I don't know about <laughs> the answers. Uh, well, there's one more uh, question, uh, I hope, uh, as short from it's, Lorenzo. It's a, it's a short question, but uh, again, the answer may be uh, everlasting. But it, and it uh, brings together the two presentations, uh, if anything, but uh, it refers to the second uh, question Professor Ferrari raised about uh, uh, effectivity. So, uh, you know, uh, you ask uh, what, uh, what, what is effective. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, what my question is about uh, effectivity itself. So, uh, in my mind, it's uh, instrumental value. So, you know, uh, effectivity 
to what, uh, to achieve what kind of goal, and uh, and that is the, the the shortest question I can ask. So when you talk about effectivity, uh, what do you have in mind? What kind of uh, goals do you have in mind? And this brings me very quickly to Andrew's presentation. Uh, we heard a lot about conflicts, uh, but uh, uh, the, the, uh, do you think that uh, there is a society that is vital and dynamic without conflict? So, or the question, if you want, uh, what, what do you think an ideal society uh, uh, look like uh, in terms of uh, managing conflict? Uh, is it a society that resolves those conflicts or a society that simply manages the, those conflicts, that is, live with them without falling apart? So we're lawyers, so we cannot think of a conflictless society, uh, also from a very selfish point of view. But uh, when, do you want to give an answer now? Or, yeah? But I, I'm sure, that, I mean, the, the, the three questions were extremely interesting and wide in their scope, and I'm sure that we are going to deal with the answers to your questions uh, today and tomorrow. So this, the answer, the, the, quest, the answers that may be given now will not exhaust the topic. Professor Ferrari. I'll, I'll answer as far as possible. Starting from the last uh, question, uh, um, effective uh, to grant uh, uh, people uh, the freedom to live according to their uh, religious and uh, cultural uh, beliefs and practice. That is, um, was my guiding principle. Uh, the um, evaluating different system, how much freedom they give, they give to people to, um, to follow uh, their own uh, uh, religious and cultural uh, convictions, uh, practices, uh, that was my, my guiding principle. Uh, to the second question by um, Karayanis, um, of course, uh, there is a collective identity in, uh, in Europe, in Italy, it's quite evident, etc., and it's largely a Christian identity. I think that is inevitable. I take it uh, as a, a matter of fact. Of course, you, you should uh, um, take it into account to balance, uh, to avoid uh, discrimination. It's something you need to take into account, but you can't cancel it. It is there. You, you need to balance, etc. Uh, regarding the first uh, question, are we really as monistic as we like to uh, believe? Um, I, would, I would like to put the, the, the question exactly in, in, in these terms, because in a way um, uh, we like to think that uh, through um, a uniform legal system, uh, we are able to grant uh, uh, equal rights. Uh, uh, and, and, and this is, uh, in my opinion, important to, um, uh, to, to the, the collective uh, um, um, uh, perception of uh, uh, Europeans. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, international private law as uh, something uh, uh, which uh, contradicts this uh, monistic uh, approach, and, and that is, of course, uh, true. Uh, two Moroccans, uh, uh, the two Moroccans uh, um, I need to take into account, uh, uh, they come from Morocco, they, there is a different law, etc. Uh, nevertheless, it seems to me that uh, uh, international private law is uh, uh, moving uh, in the direction of giving less weight to the place of origins uh, and more weight to, to the place where people live. Uh, and so this um, idea of uh, uh, legal pluralism through international uh, private law in some way was stronger in the past than today. That is my, my impression. Last uh, question, the uh, relationship between uh, family and uh, citizenship. Uh, speaking of Europe, 
maybe not uh, of other parts of the world. Well, I do not think, I, I, I do not see such strong relationship between family and uh, citizenship. I think it is uh, stronger the relation between uh, family and religion, in a way. Let, let me explain this point, and then I stop. Um, today, in Europe, there is no problem if I want to marry a French woman uh, or, uh, or, uh, or a Polish woman. Uh, nationality, when we come to marriage, is not so relevant. But uh, there might be a problem if I am a Christian and I want to marry a non-Christian woman, because a canon law put some limits, and, and Jewish law too, and Islamic law too. So in a way, um, it seems to me, but I'm not sure this was your question, that while nation, nationality, citizenship, is not an important factor today in Europe, when I have to choose my wife, um, uh, when I have to choose my wife, uh, my wife's religion is something uh, which has some impact on, uh, on the, my possibility, my right to, to marry her. Um, responding to Lorenzo, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, but I think we have to consider, I mean, whose, whose ideal, whose objective are we talking about? I like the image that Lawrence Friedman has of the law being the rope on which a tug of war takes place. And that's very much how I see things uh, happening in, in Malaysia. But look, we, we don't want a situation like... Um, you know, Tacitus talking about Roman Britain said they created solitude and called it peace. That's not, I'm interested in whether Arif thinks that describes Singapore very <laughs> adequately, but we'll come back to that later on. Um, um, so there are conflicting agendas. And I, I think I get from your question that, you know, maybe this is just the human condition. Um, from I mean, it's not up to me as a, as a scholar to make idealistic prescriptions, notwithstanding my romantic attachment to Sarawak, um, you know, for, for, for other countries to follow. I think that's not really the, what we're talking about. From a government perspective, it's definitely stability. But beyond that, there's a dangerous tendency, not just to manipulate religious issues, but to create religious issues for purely momentary political purposes, staying in power is very important, particularly when you've got corruption scandals breaking out against you in every part of the world, you start to get desperate and you start to exploit religion in order to maintain your positions. This is very, very dangerous stuff. And that is the problem. I would love to say this is just the human condition and we sort of model through it and over a long period of time maybe it's sort of stable. I would love to be able to say that, but I think a lot of people are feeling that the basis on which manageability has happened over 500 years is slowly slipping away to something that comes beyond the manageable, um, you know, because of advancing religious extremism, which people find very threatening. I think that is the the nub of the uh, of the issue for me. <clears throat> Thank you. Let, let me add two pieces, if you don't mind, of of comment uh, before we had the coffee break. Uh, the first has to do with the fact that, uh, of course, what you say about the prevailing uh, Christian contribution to national identity in Italy—that's the way I like to put it. Not to talk of straightforward of Christian identity, but large Christian contribution to national identity in Italy. It is true, though, that there are devices that are meant there to manage the situation. Now, for instance, every year the uh, official gazette publishes the list of all Jewish holidays, the idea being that official events should not be 
are fixed in those periods. Uh, and of course, you, you may, you may not take data into consideration. If you don't, it will depend up to, in this case, to the Jewish community to raise their voice. Now, it did happen about 15 years ago that there was an early dissolution of parliament and the unexpected electoral day was fixed during the Jewish Pesach. And the Jewish community complained about it and the date was indeed changed. So this, you know, it, it is a way to manage. Uh, so uh, of course, uh, it is true, as you say, that here in this law school, we would never put an exam on the 25th of December. Uh, but at the same time, we uh, can, we have the instruments to deal with that. Coming to the second question uh, uh, about, about uh, uh, religious law being enforced through international private law. And I said because we organized a seminar on this and you gave a very important contribution. The point is that when a judge enforces uh, the law of a foreign country, it does enforce the law of a foreign country, not religious law. So it does enforce Moroccan family law. Whether Moroccan family law is inspired by Islam or not does make a, a difference. Now, it may be that there are countries in which family law is not part of the code, but that's not the case of Morocco and, 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 uh, and, and other countries. So I do agree with you. Uh, what is also interesting to notice is that depending on the interest of the case, there's a, a Spanish colleague who wrote a very nice essay on this, depending on the particular uh, interest of the case, the person will try to make use of state Moroccan law or to make a, a use of religious law depending on what is more favorable to win in the case. So uh, it's what not... Forum shopping, absolutely, absolutely. By all means. By all means. Uh, just to complete, of course, if the uh, religious inspiration of state law is too strongly affected by religion, which is incompatible with constitutional values, then you always have the public policy exception or the exception of order public. From this, we have, let's say, very uh, uncertain trends in, in Europe. Uh, uh, yes. I totally agree that it is, it is a huge problem, and in fact, we had the seminar for this. Uh, we have, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, of course, we don't have the answer, <laughs> but we know how to look for answers in the plural. But I think that, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the speakers, to the participants, and we're going now to enjoy a good uh, coffee break. We have uh, almost 20 minutes. We'll be back by 11.30, please. Ah.